Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Ian, for your introduction. <clears throat> I'm delighted to give the opening presentation at today's conference. And uh, as we know, it's about uh, the conference today is about adapting to challenging times and the role of innovation in beef production. And these are, of course, challenging times. Um, with decoupled support and increasing exposure uh, to market forces, Northern Ireland farmers have had to adapt to cope with these changes in recent years. And um, if we look back to pre-2009, <clears throat> a decade of stagnation up until that point in beef prices has given way to a more volatile market. Uh, and that, that has um, created opportunities, but it's also created serious challenges for both farmers and processors with regard to managing their businesses. And today, I'm going to give an analysis of uh, the current state of the beef industry, both at a global and more local level. Um, firstly, just looking at the, the global situation, <clears throat> there are ma many challenges and opportunities for the beef industry at a, a, an international level. It's, uh, it's only a short presentation, so I intend to give you a flavour of demand and supply at a global level and, and, and try to give an, a general update on in international trade and prices. And um, looking firstly, a good place to start uh, when looking at the international situation is to, to look at the, um, the global economic situation. And there, there are um, ongoing concerns that the, the economic recovery in some areas of the world is starting to falter. Close to home concerns have been raised about Germany um, and, and growth in the Eurozone generally. <clears throat> Germany is the, the powerhouse of the, uh, or has been known as the powerhouse of the Eurozone economy. And uh, growth there has now been revised to 1.4% in 2014. And it's expected to be something similar in 2015. And this is behind what uh, was previously expected. And um, in France, growth is forecast to be less than 1%, uh, a big market for Northern Ireland beef and lamb, uh, uh, and, and, and growth also to be low there next year. Italy remains in recession, and there's been uh, uh, um, very modest, modest growth expected there next year. Uh, while the recovery in Britain and Ireland is encouraging and more assured, the figures uh, for mainland Europe and, and also the, the reducing strength of the euro um, are a concern for, for exporters into that market. And looking further afield, you know, the BRIC economies were, I suppose, came to the rescue of the world economy in uh, 2010 when we were in recession, and was uh, strong levels of growth in, in Brazil and Russia. Um, growth in both the uh, Russian and Brazilian markets has now slowed, and figures for the first half of the year now show that Brazil is in recession, and the Russian market appears to be stagnating. And, and the rise in the middle classes in those countries was a serious economic driver, and a serious driver of beef consumption um, in particular. And, and economic stagnation in those regions does give some cause for concern. But on the positive side, um, growth is continuing apace in the Far East <clears throat> and in other parts of the Americas. Down the western seaboard, for example, and you can see here of South America, there's strong growth in Colombia, Peru, and Chile, and that probably helped to uh, uh, draw some demand for uh, beef in from exporting countries in other parts of South America, such as Brazil and Argentina. And, um, in, uh, in, in the Far East in particular, and you can see, looking down the right-hand side of this, uh, of this map of the world, very strong growth expected in China, 7%, uh, is probably the highest level of global, global growth expected this year. These figures, by the way, are from uh, the Economic uh, Intelligence Unit, Economist Intelligence Unit, Malaysia, strong levels of growth, uh, the Philippines and Indonesia, all showing strong levels of growth. And encouraging as well, I suppose, is that the, the, the American economy, the US economy, is expected to reach growth of 3% next year, which is uh, ahead of what's expected in Europe. And uh, growth is expected in Mexico and uh, Canada as well. So while there has been some stagnation in the, the Eurozone, Brazil and Russia is a concern, it is offset uh, to a large extent by the strength of the Asian markets and recovery uh, in the USA, which seems that bit more assured. Um, so turning now, you know, an impact this has is obviously on consumption uh, of beef on a global basis. And uh, between a mixture of tight supplies and uh, wider economic challenges uh, that we've just discussed. There were concerns about consumption as we moved into uh, 2014. US consumption was, uh, is in a downward trend, uh, and, and tight domestic supplies have uh, exacerbated that, uh, as well as strong export demand. Tough econ economic conditions in the States, uh, plus strong price increases, has meant that demand that is, is really centered around lower price uh, products, such as mints and burgers. Tight domestic supplies is one reason for reduced consumption in Russia, while the import restrictions imposed by Moscow on Europe will not have done anything to help the beef supply there in the short term. They have now turned more to Brazil uh, to, uh, for increasing levels of supply. 
and, and there are concerns as well about consumption in Europe with poor demand for premium beef cuts and price competition from cheaper meats. Meanwhile, in Brazil, consumption will have been negatively affected by the recession, while lower prices for poultry and pig meat um, will provide stiff competition for beef. Strong export competition or export opportunities, particularly to Russia, in Brazil in the second half of the year have probably driven up domestic prices. Potential for global uh, consumption growth uh, at a global level outside, say, uh, uh, Great Britain and Ireland, rests very much in uh, the Chinese market and the Asian market generally, with a growing population and, and a growth in the middle class uh, been a key driver of consumption. And the development of Western-style retail and food service development has really helped drive demand in those economies, with uh, economic growth expected to remain at 7% next year in China. Further consumption growth in China is expected. And just looking at that and, and, and how that um, uh, manifests itself on a global uh, market, uh, the strength of those various world markets is very, illust uh, very well illustrated in this chart. This chart uh, uh, shows a, a proxy for the consumer expenditure index by multiplying the producer price in each country uh, by the level of domestic consumption. And the results, it, it's weighted by the level of exports. And, and the, 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 um, the results clearly indicate a strong, uh, the strong potential of the Asian market. And it gives a certain sense of growth in the South, South American market, but it has slowed in the last year or so. The more mature Western markets, such as Europe and the US, have shown price increases in expenditure, uh, which have been uh, generally driven by higher prices, whereas population and consumption per capita has been more constrained. Turning now to supply. better. Um, turning now to supply, it is clear that the global beef supply is constrained at a general level. The tight margins associated with beef productions in, in Northern Ireland are reported in many other regions throughout the world. And for technical and economic reasons, there's been a gradual shift away from beef production in various regions as land is given over to more profitable enterprises. And in recent years, that has meant dairy and crop production. Cow herds are under pressure are stagnating in many of the large production regions of the world. The USA has seen a gradual decline in its suckler herd, and that was driven to a large degree by the drought in recent years. And despite strong prices for feeder cattle, the cow herd was expected to decline in 2014. The Brazilian herd fell uh, sharply in 2013 due to poor produ producer prices coupled with the lure of crop production. And in uh, Australia, the decline in uh, uh, pasture land uh, due to drought has been a key concern in Queensland. Apart from modest growth in uh, Uruguay and Argentina, the only real meaningful growth in global herds has been in the Indian buffalo herd. And uh, that's an important source of cheap protein in Asia and the Middle East, but it's not really a competitor product for the likes of beef that we're producing in Northern Ireland. Production is expected to be down generally around the world, uh, as you can see here. Uh, by the end of this year, with the declining production in the USA probably having the greatest impact globally, the declining herd and the, uh, the calf crop has led to reduced slaughterings in the US. Uh, contrary to forecasts at the start of the year, uh, Australia has been putting more uh, beef onto the international market due to very high slaughter levels, and this has primarily been driven by drought. European production is expected to decline slightly in 2015, having increased by about 3 or 4% this year, and that follows sharp declines in the EU beef herd in recent years. So turning now to trade, and uh, it's clear that the reduced supply in the coming years has had a significant impact on uh, world beef trade and and on the major beef importers. China and Hong Kong, uh, seen here on the left, are the largest, uh, probably the largest importers in the world, followed by the US. Uh, Russia uh, is probably the third largest, although in this chart it's uh, only showing uh, imports for the first four months of the year, is, uh, is probably the third largest importer in the world. And demand and supply in these countries have a major impact on the world price of beef. And so far in 2014, as you can see here, uh, China, Hong Kong, and the USA have increased uh, beef imports significantly, and the USA has sharply increased imports of lean uh, grinding beef from Australia, Canada, and Mexico to make up for the, uh, the shortage of domestic slaughter. Australian imports uh, into America are up by 36%. Now, we've mentioned the, the US and Chinese market repeatedly during the last few moments. Uh, you, know, you get a sense where that's where the world growth is coming from, and the importance of those markets will not be lost in delegates. These markets are currently returning very strong prices to the global market, and both markets are having a significant impact on the trade. Last year, Chinese imports uh, rose by 380% uh, in beef, 
compared to the previous year, and that's an astonishing rate of growth. It's almost a fourfold increase, and uh, much of that increase would have been facilitated by imports from Australia, but also elsewhere, um, such as South America. And it's important to note uh, that of all of the major beef importers listed here, the UK has access uh, to just Hong Kong uh, and doesn't have direct in access into China. Uh, we obviously do have access to the EU, the wider EU, but that shows some of the challenges that are facing the industry. Right now, one of the industry's main objectives is to win access to these key markets. And uh, the UK Export Certification Partnership, of which LMC is a member, and DARD have been working very steadily in this regard in, in, in recent years in conjunction with uh, the authorities in GB. At the moment, Northern Ireland factories are preparing for USDA inspections, which will hopefully result in access to the US market sometime next year. And uh, the, South has been, uh, the Republic of Ireland has been through the uh, inspections process, and they're hoping to have access approved in the near future. The Chinese market is also interesting. There are uh, large volumes of beef being traded from Northern Ireland to Hong Kong, and it is possible that some of that beef is finding its way to China through grey channels once it reaches Hong Kong. Um, volumes have increased significantly to Hong Kong early this year from Northern Ireland, and, and it is an excellent downlet for boneless beef and offals. But direct access to China, of course, would open up more opportunities with the potential to achieve higher prices than are uh, currently available, say, into Hong Kong. And this is an excellent opportunity that's likely to remain over the long term. Rabobank say they expect Chinese beef imports to grow by 15 to 20 percent annually over the next five years. And it's been, uh, it's been stated by some in the industry that access to the uh, US and Chinese markets could be a game changer. It remains to be seen whether this is actually going to be the case and whether indeed access uh, will be achieved uh, sooner rather than later. But it is clear that opportunities exist beyond the traditional hotspots of Europe and, in, and the industry and government are showing a joint commitment to developing access. Currently the UK does not have access, as I said, to these markets and significant diplomatic and, uh, and technical uh, um, efforts are being expended to agree export health certificates that would give us access to these key countries. So moving now to global prices and the attached chart, as we see here, has been produced by Rabobank. Um, we, uh, we see uh, on this uh, price developments at a global level over the last five years. The blue line represents an index of global producer prices. It's based on finished cattle prices in major producer countries around the world and weighted by individual countries' share of exports. The chart tells a very positive story. Uh, Billy, from uh, the middle of last year, it shows an increase on, uh, uh, on global prices uh, across the world. And prices now sitting at about 180% uh, of what they were in 2009. So that's a significant increase. Breaking that down to uh, individual countries, and I've, I've shown some key countries here, including Northern Ireland, the global price increases uh, I suppose have been driven by the US and China in particular. Uh, tight supplies mentioned earlier have meant that US prices have increased radically in the last, um, in the last year or so, um, and now are higher, sitting higher than Northern Ireland prices, which is a, a remarkable change given where prices were in January 13. And uh, despite the high prices, it is reported that uh, within, within America, uh, demand for US beef uh, remains reasonably firm and the outlook for fed cattle prices in the USA remains strong. Strong prices in the, in the States have driven up prices in Canada, Mexico uh, as well, where, where, where they're sucking in imports from, and prices in uh, Mexico, for instance, have increased by 15% this year. Chinese prices have remained high in 2014, with retail prices reportedly now 6% higher than 2013 levels, and again, this has been driven by tight supplies and strong domestic demand. Australian prices you see down uh, at the bottom of this chart, um, uh, shown here in euros and South American prices have, have shown a, a slight increase over the course of the last year. Um, and in, in, in real terms, and, and that's in the, the currency real, the Brazilian price is now at record levels, although its currency has weakened, uh, which means that its price hasn't been as high in, in euro terms. Uh, and that does maintain its competitiveness in international markets. Kettle prices have risen steadily um, in, in in Great Britain, but prices remain subdued at an EU level. Uh, GB and NI have certainly bucked that trend, and that, that leads us in to a look at the... Sorry. <laughs> that leads us into the local landscape. Um, 
And we'll take a look again, looking at the, the key factors such as demand, supply, trade and price, as well as some of the key themes that have emerged in Northern Ireland over the last year. So looking firstly at, um, at, at price, uh, seeing as that was where we left off, looking at the global trade. And it's clear that uh, volatility, I suppose, is, is the new norm in, in the beef market in Northern Ireland and, 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 and around the UK generally. We, we've been through a bit of a roller coaster in the last few years with a decade of stagnation uh, post BSE. Farm gate prices then rose in 2008 and 2009. They came back again in 2010. They rose again in 2011 and stagnated somewhat in 2012 and then rose sharply after uh, the introduction or after the um, aftermath of horse, horse meat in 2013. Uh, they rose to almost four pound a kilo. And I suppose, looking back now, the horse meat uh, crisis was, uh, ha ha had a major impact on the market. It affected, I suppose, the, the, the sourcing policy of British retailers, whose reputations uh, were impacted by those events. And the, uh, the emphasis of retailers in, in their sourcing, I suppose, moved to uh, shortening supply chains, DNA testing, and, and delivering full traceability and forensic, forensic auditing to ensure that such a crisis would never visit them again. And that, that does produce opportunities for uh, a region like Northern Ireland with very, very high standards of traceability and quality assurance, um, where we produce an excellent product. Uh, and there was always a premium attached to the UK identity in the beef market, and uh, there was a, a premium attached to inspect beef within that market. And suddenly these premia uh, were magnified in the advent of horse meat, and uh, Northern Ireland inspect bonuses increased to 14 pence a kilo, and penalties for non-FQS cattle increased sharply, and a significant gap emerged between Northern Ireland and ROI prices. Prices rose at such a rate that, and you can see that here, prices rose to the point where people were talking about a bubble emerging in beef prices, and uh, ultimately, uh, as we moved into 2014, the prices weren't sustained. And by the third quarter of 2013, processors were getting concerned about a lack of demand for manufacturing beef and a, a more stagnant EU market, and processors continued to pay high prices for prime cattle, but there were reports behind the scenes that um, there were uh, greater, uh, greater stocks building up of four-quarter beef bought at high prices. And with stocks building, the general beef price fell significantly in the first half of 2014, and prices didn't just fall in Northern Ireland, the trade became weaker right across uh, the EU generally and in, in Great Britain. And the price decline in Northern Ireland came at the, uh, in 2014 despite actually having tight cattle supplies. More recently, uh, the price has recovered its, uh, some of its losses, but the trade has remained weaker for some grades of cattle. And looking at those grades of cattle, it's quite interesting what's happened in terms of the lower prices for plain cattle and cows. Cow prices had reached, uh, factories were quoting in around uh, £3, even slightly higher uh, in, in mid-2013 for um, O plus 3 grade prime, uh, 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 cows, and, and prices came under pressure from about the start of September 13. And you can see that drop represented by the blue line at the top of the screen. Um, but what we also seen was uh, a drop in the price of uh, plain cattle, plain prime cattle, and it reflected a weaker European market for manufacturing type beef and the fact that poor grading carcasses were out of spec for several retailer contracts. And as we can see, there was downward pressure on uh, the price of these P-grade cattle relative to the price of uh, R-grade cattle, uh, which is shown by the, the blue line here at the bottom of the screen. So um, that is something that has continued to be a feature of the Northern Ireland market this year. It's worth noting that comparisons for late October actually show that Northern Ireland prices for these types of cattle, O3 and P3 grade uh, steers, um, are if anything actually higher than English prices for the same grade. So just looking at the, the UK trade, and uh, we're obviously a part of the UK, and uh, Northern Ireland prices have, have recovered significantly in the last few months, and the manner of the lift in the trade uh, came as a, a surprise to many. Uh, uh, some processors actually raised quotes by about 22 pence a kilo in the space of a fortnight in early October, and that, that type of price increase uh, is, is really unprecedented. Uh, it came a few weeks after a sharp increase in, in English prices. The UK trade is now significantly ahead of the remainder of the EU. Um, and uh, it's important to note that the Northern Ireland trade uh, is, is, is actually now ahead of uh, several regions of England. For example, in the last week of October, the average price for R3 steers in Northern Ireland was 3.49 pence a kilo. That was higher than the English Midlands and Wales and Southern England. And it was higher than the prices reported for Nor or it was slightly lower than the prices reported for Northern England. A similar trend was reported for R3 heifers. 
for O3 grading stock NA prices were significantly ahead of the Midlands and, uh, and Southern England. And similarly, for, for R3 young bull prices, uh, they were ahead uh, of, of prices right across England. So that, that, that really is an, an unprecedented trend for this time of the year. Uh, it reflects the fact that supplies are tight. But normally at this time of the year, our prices are generally behind uh, uh, GB levels. But at the moment, they're actually ahead when normally they'd be very well behind GB levels. So uh, Northern Ireland and England's, English prices are now roughly £200 ahead of ROI R3 steer prices. And steer prices in the south uh, are, are slightly behind those, uh, those equivalent prices per se. R3 young bulls and steers in France and Germany and Italy, uh, represented by the, um, the blue and uh, uh, black lines on that chart. You notice that the, um, obviously the, 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 the UK R3 steer price so much further ahead. So that really puts into context the state of the uh, EU market at the minute and the strength of the UK trade. <laughs> Looking briefly at store prices, uh, the rise in, in store cattle prices in, in recent years has been something of a, a double-edged sword for producers. Calf producers have plainly benefited from the higher prices, and, uh, and, uh, and strong prices for calves and store cattle would be essential to drive any sort of recovery in the suckler herd. Meanwhile, beef finishers have faced higher costs for bought-in cattle, uh, not to mention a, a, greater, uh, a greater amount of capital tied up in stock. So in the springtime, store cattle prices were well ahead of previous year levels. Um, but the price came under pressure in the summertime, driven partly by a, a, a poor trade in finished cattle. But in recent weeks, we've seen a, a, a strong recovery in store prices, and they're now back above uh, previous year levels. And it's uh, been very much supply-driven, with a substantial drop in the number of younger cattle on the ground between, say, 6 and 18 months of age over the last year. And uh, fewer cattle have been imported from ROI onto Northern Ireland farms, and that's created more internal competition uh, from finishers for local supplies of calves, weanlings, and store cattle. And both, both factors have served to drive up prices. Um, turning now just to very briefly to look at feed costs and input costs, there's been uh, some major changes in, the, in, the, in world prices for grains over the last uh, year. The FOAO Food Price Index has shown that global cereals, uh, cereal prices have fallen generally since the spring of the year. And we've seen uh, the reduced uh, the reduced prices there reflected in lower prices for uh, straw and barley uh, to a certain extent in Northern Ireland. And with an excellent grass year in 2014, uh, silage is plentiful and prices are significantly lower than last year. And uh, uh, producers have, uh, have been able to delay housing compared to previous years when uh, cattle would have been in the house as early as August. Um, throughout the uh, UK, it's clear that uh, beef producers are struggling to cover their costs. Uh, despite uh, having the highest prices in, in Europe, and I know uh, uh, Jim will address this issue in his presentation, but it's worth considering whether a combination of, of renewed increases in, 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 in farm gate prices and reduced feed costs uh, may provide some incentive to um, uh, increase primary production in uh, 2014, particularly in light of, I suppose, there's been reductions as well in terms of oil costs, which will uh, deliver benefits in, in, in terms of lower fertilizer costs as well. So. Um, it is clear that uh, production in Northern Ireland has, has fallen significantly over the last year and it, uh, an improvement in the, in, the, in the primary production conditions is going to be required to uh, deliver improved or increased, increased production in Northern Ireland. Sorry. Yeah. So looking now at, at, at production, um, the Northern Ireland cattle supplies have come under pressure in 2014 so far. Um, prime cattle kill is down by um, um, 15,000 so, uh, 15, head so far in Northern Ireland this year. The total kill is down by 6%. Um, and, 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 and that's a reduction of about 50,000 heads since our peak, peak year of slaughtering, which was 2010. And that, uh, you know, to all intents and purposes, that's, that's actually the kill of, of, of one, one reasonably sized plant in Northern Ireland, that's a, a significant reduction in supplies. Um, one feature of that reduction in supplies this year has been the reduction in the young bull kill. And with stronger penalties and overage bulls since the start of 2014, producers have moved away from bull production and the steer production. And, and young bulls accounted for less than 10% of the prime cattle kill in the last three months. In the same period last year, they were 20% ahead of, uh, 20% of the kill. So with more male beef being produced later as steers, that inevitably leaves a gap in terms of output while we wait for those uh, steers to mature. That's one of the drivers of the tight supply at the present time. 
But uh, in terms of uh, cow throughput, it's quite interesting that the cow, uh, the cow kill has slowed in, in, in 2014. It had been running at extremely high levels in the last three years, driven to a large extent by the um, uh, greater culling of suckler cows. And, and the recent decline in the cow kill may be seen as a sign uh, of a, slow, a slowdown in the decline of the beef herd, but that remains to be seen. Just looking at the, uh, the long-term situation, um, there have been some significant changes in Northern Ireland in recent years. The results of the 2014 June census in Northern Ireland seem to confirm a trend that many commentators have seen to be inevitable uh, over the recent years. There's been a 5% decline in the beef herd, mirrored by a 5% increase in the size of the dairy herd. Now, given some of the recent difficulties in the dairy sector, it remains to be seen how this trend will develop over the course of the coming year. But the reduction in the cow herd has been driven by, uh, I suppose, technical as well as economic conditions. It has been reflected by, uh, in a very high cow kill, as we've said, but uh, it's been driven to a large extent by the very difficult production conditions uh, that have uh, occurred uh, with the bad weather in 2012 and 2013, and this had far-reaching impl implications for cow condition and fertility. Uh, ultimately, the result has been fewer, fewer calf births in Northern Ireland in recent years. So far, there's been 282,000 calf births this year. That's similar to last year but significantly lower than the previous year. And in addition, it is about 20% of a reduction compared to where we were back in uh, 2005. The fact that we're going to get more beef from the dairy herd is uh, emphasized by the fact that the uh, dairy sired male births are up by 28% uh, over the same period. Uh, but obviously, we have to do more as an industry to try and uh, encourage more production um, of high quality beef from the dairy herd. Looking now at uh, cattle supplies and prospects in terms of supplies for the next year, we can see that the tight supply that we've, uh, we've witnessed in the Northern Ireland market this year isn't going to change uh, next year. What we see here is the number of cattle on the ground between 18 and 24 months down to 7%. These are cattle that will most likely at this stage, uh, a large number of these cattle will be killed next year. Looking further back, 12 to 18 months, the number of cattle on the ground is down to 4%. Even down to 6 to 12 months, numbers are down by 3%. There has been some recovery in numbers uh, from not to 6 months in, uh, due to a recovery in the calf kill in the, in the middle of this year, or the calf, calf births in the middle of this year. But looking at a whole, it's expected that uh, production in Northern Ireland uh, in terms of uh, factory throughput will be lower as we move into uh, 2015. And it's likely that uh, there's going to be tight supplies uh, elsewhere in the EU, and certainly tight supplies in, in GB, and a reduction in, in supplies in ROI. Supplies in the South last year increased by 150,000 head. Or this year increased by 150,000 head, a substantial increase uh, compared to, uh, to previous years, a 14% increase in the prime cattle kill. And that's really put prices under pressure uh, in the South, but it's also had an impact around Europe. Um, that's going to change because when we look at the chart on the left-hand side, we can see a similar trend to Northern Ireland. Cattle between 12 and 18 months of age uh, down by 9%, and, and the South is expecting a significant drop in their kill next year. Looking at GB slaughter forecast, we can also see a, a decline forecast in the GB kill of about 2%. And across the EU, by uh, 2015, we expect a decline of 1%. So, Abundant supplies this year in the south to be reversed, and higher supplies this year in GB to be reversed, and higher supplies in the EU as a whole to be reversed. Looking finally at uh, consumption, for some time now there have been concerns about falling demand for beef at the UK and European level. Higher prices, stiff competition from cheaper proteins and negative campaigning against beef have had an impact on uh, uh, consumption for beef across Europe. But, uh, you know, encouragingly, uh, faced with the horse meat crisis in 2013, UK consumers did not reject beef. Rather, they em embraced quality, from, uh, uh, quality beef from trusted sources. And if anything, the horse meat crisis showed how resilient the beef sector actually is in terms of demand in the UK. Retail volume sales of beef in the UK this year are down by 1% for the year to date. And, and that, that may be seen as a concern, but uh, given price increases of, uh, of 5%, and increases in spend of 4%, uh, of the net result is actually reasonably positive. Retailers have undertaken a greater level of promotional activity in the last 12 weeks, and, and that may have helped to drive increased sales of burgers and frying grilling steaks, and sale, although sales of roasting cuts remain subdued. Mint sales uh, have reasonably been reasonably stable in recent times. 
So, uh, in conclusion, um, the you know the the British market is strong, um, and it's the market I suppose that's delivering high prices in Northern Ireland uh, to the industry. Uh, it's emerging from the economic downturn, with uh, real incomes now reported to be rising for the first time in five years. And the European market, which was more attractive a few, uh, a few years ago, has, has started to, has, has stagnated in recent years, and, and, and that's driven to a certain extent by a weaker economy. Um, the weaker euro also makes it slightly less attractive for exporters from Northern Ireland. Opportunities uh, for growth probably lie further afield. The Northern Ireland industry is committed to developing export industries in third countries. Gaining access to these markets really is a long-term process. Um, the rate of progress is, is, is set ultimately by the importing countries, although LMC, in conjunction with the UK Export Certification Partnership, DARD, industry together, and uh, the GB authorities have been working steadily uh, to, to, to try and realise access to the, the very strong markets around the world. Access to these markets would give an excellent opportunity to grow. The, role, the world is going to continue to struggle to supply enough beef to meet, to meet demand, and that's going to drive prices in the coming years. Tight supply has, has favoured producers in Northern Ireland. And, and that has been uh, very advantageous from the point of view of improving buying power. However, if growing the industry is an objective, uh, that's not really a long-term strategy. So through developing these market opportunities, we can help build the industry. Uh, to, uh, and to grow sustainably, the industry needs to improve its margins. And a higher price is, is really only one part of the, of, of the equation. And the other part is improving efficiency and reducing costs, and I'm really looking forward to hearing the thoughts on innovations that will help deliver in that regard from the other speakers later today. Thank you very much.